holes have a sinister reputation. They're destructive objects. They suck everything in. They're the ultimate exit doors to our universe. What I'd like to convince you of today is that despite this reputation, despite the ability to spend space-time itself, to swallow light itself, that black holes are actually uh, very much a creative aspect of our universe, that when they want to be, they can be the brightest objects in the universe, and that they fulfill an important regulatory formation. They moderate our universe so that life like we know it is actually possible. But what actually is a black hole? A black hole is a, a very strange kind of object because we can turn pretty much any object into a black hole. And the only difference is uh, we compress an object, whether it be a human, the sun, or an entire galaxy. If we just compress it in on itself and we overcome the nuclear forces, an object will collapse all the way down into a point. And Einstein's theory of general relativity tells us what happens around such a point. We call that point uh, a singularity. And so any object can really collapse into a black hole under the right circumstances. Now, of course, quantum mechanics tells us that a single point object is impossible. The object needs to be fuzzy at some level. And so, of course, the singularity is the point where our understanding of physics actually breaks down. And we don't fully understand what happens there. Now, the singularity is always hidden behind the so-called event horizon. And so we can never actually see this kind of singularity. And this means that black holes are incredibly simple objects. They're characterized by just three numbers. They have a mass. They can have a spin, so they can rotate. And at least in theory, they can also have an electrical charge. But in the astrophysical realm, we generally assume that they don't have a charge, that objects are neutral. Very, very simple objects. So what makes a black hole different from a normal object? So let's start with an object we're all familiar with. Let's start with the Earth. Suppose you're trying to hit a ball standing on the surface of the Earth. And if you hit it, hit it really hard, it'll go up and it'll come back down because the gravitational field of the Earth is sufficiently strong to track the ball all the way back down again. But if you're really good at hitting a ball like Babe Ruth here, and you could hit the ball at 11 meters a second, you could have that ball escape all the way out of Earth's gravitational field, all the way into outer space. So this is actually what spaceships do. So this is how you get an outer space and you escape from the Earth. If poor Babe Ruth now was actually near a black hole, a black hole of the same mass and repeated the same experiment, the ball would invariably end up in the singularity, it would be crushed and destroyed. And it would be impossible to get the ball away again from the singularity because the escape velocity near a black hole is larger than the speed of light, the ultimate speed limit in the universe. So the event horizon then is nothing but the point at which the escape velocity exceeds the speed of light. And that is why not even light can escape a black hole. And that's why once an object has crossed the event horizon, it is forever gone from our universe. It can never escape again. So let's imagine uh, a poor astronaut who is trying to orbit a black hole, like, say, uh, the International Space Station right now is orbiting the Earth. The black hole is the same mass as the Earth, let's imagine, but space-time is warped, is twisted by the action of the black hole, and so the gravitational field would make it impossible for our poor astronaut to actually stably orbit the black hole. Eventually, she would get sucked in, and because the tidal forces the gradient in the gravitational field is so strong, the force of gravity on her feet is stronger than that on her head, and so she would get stretched and stretched and stretched and further stretched until eventually she's nothing but a string of atoms. We call this, in technical language, spaghettification. <laughs> so what would a black hole, the mass of the Earth, actually look like? If we took the Earth and managed to collapse it into a black hole, we would end up with an object that had an event horizon, a black hole with an event horizon of nine millimeters, about this big. That's how dense, that's how small a black hole is. Now, I'm an astrophysicist, I study astrophysical black holes, and so if we collapse the entire sun into a black hole, the event horizon would have a radius of about three kilometers, so a bit bigger, but you know, by astrophysical standards, still actually quite tiny. We could go to even larger black holes, we now call them supermassive, 
And if we had a 4 million solar mass black hole, it would have a radius of 0.08 astronomical units. That's 8% of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, this black hole now is you know, starting to have a sizable mass and sizable radius. And uh, for the uh, people really paying attention, I picked this oddly specific number of 4 million solar masses, and they'll be relevant in a second. But of course, I study all black holes, and I'm particularly interested in the true monsters. So the largest black holes, the most massive black holes in the universe, can be as massive as 10 billion solar masses. And then I've indicated the orbit of Pluto here. We could comfortably fit our solar system a couple of times inside the event horizon of this object. So why did I pick 4 million solar masses? Almost every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center. And you all recognize this galaxy from uh, the night sky. This is our own Milky Way. And in fact, if we zoom into the center of the Milky Way, we find that the stars in the very center of the Milky Way orbit this empty spot. They're being flung around incredibly hard with incredible velocities. And the only way that this can happen is if there's an object with a mass of exactly 4 million solar masses. And you actually don't even need relativity to work this out. Newton alone tells you there must be an incredibly massive object there. Einstein then, of course, tells you if the object in this tiny, tiny volume wasn't a black hole, it would immediately collapse into one. But of course, the center of the Milky Way is, is pretty quiescent right now. The centers of other galaxies, however, can be lit up by a black hole, because when matter falls into a black hole, gas and dust, you form an accretion disk around the black hole that is outside the horizon, and that disk gets very, very hot, hundreds of thousands of degrees, millions of degrees, and they start to radiate. And so uh, these black holes are actually the most efficient engines in the universe. If we zoomed out, we would see a galaxy like this. This is actually a collision of two galaxies. There's something like 100 billion stars in this galaxy train wreck. All of them currently doing, you know, what, what's the dream of our energy policy? They're doing nuclear fusion. They're fusing hydrogen into helium, liberating a tremendous amount of energy. But even nuclear fusion is, is laughably inefficient compared to a rotating black hole. And so that single black hole converts 40% of the rest mass of the material that falls into the black hole into energy. So equals mc squared, as Einstein told us. c squared is a very large number. And this one billion solar mass black hole, every second, is turning the equivalent mass of the moon into pure energy. And that's why a growing supermassive black hole, a billion solar mass black hole, on its own, can outshine 100 billion stars and be the brightest object in the universe, a quasar. So what's all this energy doing? It's actually, we believe, one of the most important forces in the universe. But in order to explain to you why it's so important, I have to give you a quick crash course in galaxy formation, galaxy formation 101. So the universe started with the Big Bang. And then there was a brief period of inflation when the universe got a lot bigger. And what we were left with were these tiny, microscopic, subatomic fluctuations, density fluctuations. Some parts of the universe were denser than others. And then all that happened subsequently, this is uh, now visualized in a simulation that colleagues at MIT did, uh, structures start to collapse simply under gravity, so the denser parts grow in mass, and the less dense parts become voids. So what you're seeing here is halos of dark matter coming together, collapsing purely under gravity, and then the normal matter, the gas, starts to collect in the centers of these dark matter halos. And when the gas gets dense enough, dense enough and cold enough, you start making stars. And so this is actually what a galaxy is. It's the, the frosting on top of the gas that fell into a dark matter halo and turned into stars. So these galaxies continue to grow. They get bigger and bigger. They accumulate more and more mass. They form more and more stars. And then we ran into, uh, run into a problem. And physicists like grandiose names for their problems. Uh, we call this one the overcooling catastrophe. And all this means is that the gas continues to cool, the galaxies get too big, the galaxies are too violent. We need a regulatory mechanism that heats the gas back up, stops it from cooling, makes the galaxies calmer again. And we believe that supermassive black holes, quasars, are the agent that does that. So in a sense, you can, you can see the, the quasars, the black holes going off here now and throwing the gas back out again. We believe that quasars, supermassive black holes, are the thermostats of galaxies that regulate the growth of galaxies themselves. And so by 
throttling the formation of new stars. There are fewer supernovae, and the galaxies are calmer. And of course, that's good for us, because around those stars are planets, and on those planets are people that listen to talks. And if there are too many supernovae, that's extremely unhealthy. There's lots of radiation and UV light. You don't want that near you. So we should be grateful for the fact that our Milky Way has a black hole at its center. This is what I study. This is what my research group at ETH works on. We're trying to understand the growth of black holes from the beginning of the universe until today. What you see here is what is, for me, actually one of the most profound images that humanity has ever taken. This is an X-ray image of the sky taken by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. This is an X-ray telescope the size of a bus that was launched in 1999 by NASA by the Space Shuttle. And almost every point that you see in this image is, one way or another, growing black holes, feeding black holes, some of them in nearby galaxies, some of them at the edge of the universe right after the Big Bang. And I want to understand all of them. So here's something we're doing right now. This is a, a way of looking at the relationship between black holes and galaxies that my group is uh, trying to develop. What you're seeing here are Hubble images of a bunch of galaxies. And the green stuff you see is gas. And the gas is being lit up by the light from the quasar, from the black hole in the center of the galaxy. So think about if you go out at night and there's some fog. And you take out a flashlight and you shine the flashlight onto the fog, the fog starts to be illuminated. This is kind of the same idea, but on the scale of a galaxy. And the flashlight is a billion solar mass quasar. And galaxies are large. They're tens of thousands of light years across, hundreds of thousands of light years across. And so the time between the light being emitted by the quasar and hitting those clouds is significant. And so when we want to under understand how galaxies and black holes interact, you know, we just don't live long enough, and especially PhD uh, study courses are not long enough to study this process. So we're trying to find new ways in which to understand how these systems change over time. So we're looking at these light echoes of the outbursts of black holes as they ripple out across galaxies. And so here's a visualization. This is also data, but this is of a, an individual star that gets brighter and fainter as time goes on. It goes brighter and fainter. And so the light echoes travel out across the gas around these systems. Now, of course, this is a star, so it does it on short time scales, and we can observe it. What we're trying to do with these observations of galaxies and quasars is analogous to that, but of course, we can never see a change. We just don't live long enough. So I'd like to finish with this visualization in full general relativity of what it would look like if we fell into the four million solar mass black hole at the center of the Milky Way. You can see space-time is being distorted. This, the background stars are completely being distorted. And one thing you should notice here, that, that the horizon has no reality. It's not a surface. And I think, we've, I think we've already passed the horizon. So we already lost to this universe. And all that's left now is we keep falling further and further towards the center, and we're about to hit the singularity. And when we hit the singularity, then it's over. <laughs>